Thank you guys. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So uh, today we actually have, I actually have a lot of slides today actually. So we actually have to finish the presentation I did last time, and then I have like a whole new set of slides for you. There's kind of like a presentation and a half today. Um, but again, I want this to be a really casual presentation. You know, if you have any questions, just ask me at any time. If you have any questions, if the people online, if you have any questions, just type it into the chat. And I'll try to uh, answer it as soon as possible. And I'll try to remember if I get asked a question just to uh, repeat the question. Yeah, so everyone online, if you need something or if you can't hear me, just put it in the chat and I'll take a look at it eventually. Okay. So the exam is what, four weeks away now? <laughs> so, you know, pressure's just starting to, don't panic, <laughs> remain calm. The most important lesson for today is remain calm. And so we just finished uh, the presentation from last time. So we were talking about basal insulins last time. We, talk, we were talking about how basal insulins work. If you haven't seen my presentation, they're up on YouTube and my website, and you can just review that, and we're just beginning from, from that presentation. Yeah. Okay, so we were talking about how uh, glargy, if you concentrate it, it has a bit of a slower, it has a slower, uh, slower peak and it's more smooth, and that leads to less hypoglycemia. It's because if you concentrate something, it's kind of like a really t t tightly bound uh, ball of yarn. It kind of takes longer to unwind, and that leads to a slower, uh, slower peak and longer duration of action. Uh, Glargine did a cardiovascular study. Uh, remember we were talking about all these cardiovascular studies because of Avandia. After Avandia, everyone wants a cardiovascular study to prove that they don't cause heart attacks. And so Glargine did one and it was shown as okay. So here, let's get into the practical part of it. Say I'm a patient and you're about to start me on insulin. What are the kind of things that you'll say to me, and what are things to uh, what are yeah what are things you'll say to me, and what are things you don't want to say to me? So say I'm your patient, you're starting me on insulin. What are you gonna to say to me? So dosage, hypoglycemia symptoms. Yeah, so you're gonna to talk to me about dosage. You're gonna to talk to me about hypoglycemia. What exactly are you gonna to talk to me about hypoglycemia? Are you gonna get hypoglycemia from this? Uh, Symptoms of hypoglycemia. Symptoms and of hypoglycemia. How to manage those. Okay, good. Symptoms of hypoglycemia, how to manage them. What other things are you going to talk to me for starting me on insulin? Changing. Injection technique, good. Yeah, so kind of, you know, uh, so yeah, that stuff. But you also want to just explain why people are going on insulin. Usually people are, like, I'll give you, if you haven't start, if you've never started on someone on insulin, Usually they're pretty resistant. It's usually pretty rare that it's just like, wow, yeah, you start me on insulin. I, 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 I absolutely love to be started on insulin. Usually they're gonna be resistant. So you wanna to explain to them that there's, okay, I've got a question here. Yeah, it's not their fault. That's the biggest thing. Good, good, Sheila, that's, that's excellent. Uh, you wanna explain that, you know, a lot of doctors, especially even some of the doctors that I work with, they have insulin as kind of a punishment for failing. And so that's the first thing you want to kind of diffuse that, you know, it's due to maybe cell dysfunction, uh, it's not because you didn't exercise enough or you didn't do, do whatever, uh, that it's just your beta cells are slowly, uh, slowly retiring and that's why you need insulin to kind of help it out. Good. Uh, there we go. Oh, whoa. So I'm letting <laughs> Okay, good. So this was kind of like what Sheila was talking about. You want to tell them that insulin, insulin is not the enemy, they're not a failure because they have to start insulin. And because of the rapid beta cell decline, a lot of patients with that type 2 diabetes eventually go on to insulin. Okay. Okay. Uh, you want to have, have to you want to let them you know ask their questions. Usually, you know, usually they have a lot of questions. A lot of times they kind of think about their grandmother or their grandfather. They think, oh, I remember them boiling these glass syringes and things like that, and having to inject. And that's kind of the image they have in their mind. So I find it really helpful to just show them the insulin pen and let them play around with it. 
Uh, then I take the instant cartridge out, put, put on a pen needle, and I just inject myself just to show when it has occurred. They're, that's what they're mostly afraid of, that it's going to be like so painful and stuff like that. But once you show them, you do a dry injection on yourself and show them it doesn't hurt, you can like visibly see them calm down. The shoulders calm down, they take a deep breath, and then they're, more, then they're actually listening to you. Because when they're scared, they're not actually listening to anything you say. They're all, you can be talking about beta cell dysfunction, but they're hearing uh, death, or pain, or injection, or failure. That's all, that's all that they hear. So you need to calm them down before you start to start them on insulin. Okay. Um, and then, you know, you want to acknowledge that diabetes is difficult to manage and, you know, just, and just support the patient through that. And then as a healthcare professionals, it's our job to express empathy. You know, if they feel, okay, I'm sad about X, you can tell them, yes, you know, in your situation, I would also feel sad about X, or that's a common reaction. You, know, you want to be empathetic and supportive. <laughs> And yeah, insulin can be intimidating. So uh, you know, try to make it just try to make it less intimidating for your patients. Okay. Also, you want to listen to them. Uh, you know, consider who else could maybe like you know, you can talk to them about their doctor. Your doctor feels this is the best solution, or you know, your specialist thinks this, this is the best solution. So try to just get them comfortable with the situation. And that, you know, so it's good that you talk about hypoglycemia, that's important, but you want to talk to about how, you know, we're going to start you on a low dose, so we're going to minimize the chance of hypoglycemia. I know that, you know, on the news, there's insulin, people on insulin who are crashing their car and killing themselves all the time, but that's not going to happen to you because we're going to start you on a low dose and slowly go up, so we're going to minimize the chance of hypoglycemia. Yeah. Okay, so what are some don'ts about starting people on insulin? We'll just go through this quickly. Don't tell them the side effects first. Well, no, you do have to tell them the side effects. Um, you do have to talk about a hypoglycemia and how to manage it. You do have to tell them about that there is a risk of weight gain. Yeah, don't like. You have to be honest with your patients, and it, you you want to tell them about about this kind of stuff. But you can talk to them about like how you use metformin to mitigate some of the weight gain or GLP or exercise can reduce the weight gain, that kind of stuff. I hope you just don't go too much details. Just think that you need to keep picture. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good thing. If you're feeling overwhelmed, don't like, you know, do a little bit of details. Just get, kind of get in the main picture. Yeah, that's a good idea. So here's some don'ts. We kind of talked about it already. And yeah, so yeah, don't dismiss their concerns about hypoglycemia. Uh, try to be as empathetic as possible. Try not to come up, try not to come off as judgmental. And yeah, and if if you talk to them and give them enough time and answer all their questions, I I find that most people come around to it that. If you give them enough empathy and understanding, they don't eventually understand, yes, okay, this is the best choice for me. Okay. okay, so let's start with questions on starting insulin. So here's my first question. I'll let you guys take a look at it. Okay, so let's go through the answer. So the answer for this one is E. Now let's talk about how we how we get how we get there. Yeah. So why is A wrong? Because it's more five. Yeah, the titration is way too aggressive. Uh, so five is is actually one of the correct answers. If you look at the guidelines, they'll say if there are people who are really light, under 50 kilograms, you can start them at a lower dose. And that's very important for like really elderly people. Like, you know, I, I 
see a lot of elderly Asian ladies who are like 90 pounds. And so I think 90 or 80 pounds. I think starting them on 10 would actually be probably too much for them. And so you can use 0.1 to 0.2 units per kilogram as a starting dose for people who have a lower body weight. Uh, C is the standard answer. That's the standard 10 units and then increased by one or two. Why is C wrong? Yeah, same thing, it's four to five. So E is the correct answer because both E and C are correct. Yeah. Any questions about that? The answer is E. Because uh, B and C are both correct. Yeah. So you gotta have to you have to be there's there's a couple of questions where it might be more than one answer. So you have to be watch out for those on the exam. Yeah. I've actually got to embarrassingly enough, I've gotten a couple of those questions wrong because I'll see that E is the right answer and then I, I'll just skip to the next answer. But then when we're talking about it afterwards at at Jameson's, it's like, oh, there was a there was a more than one of the above, or all of the above, then I got that question wrong. So then, so the Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of these are in the guidelines. Uh, so here, let me show you. So this is from the guidelines, and you can see uh, there it is. Yeah. For lean patients, okay, right there. So that's in the guidelines, and then the standard is the ten units at that time. Oh, it's point one point two. So, but we won't get on exam. We won't get two, right? We will get either one or two, the correct question. Uh, no, sometimes there's uh, more than one answer, or A and B, or C. So we can put more than one answer? Yeah, so like, yeah, because there's Same sometimes there's a, like a B and C, or A and C, or, or things like that. So you have to watch, so you read the question carefully. <laughs> yeah, because both, both B and C are correct in this case. Okay, and then yeah, and then this is this is the other other standard one, and that you can see it's uh, ten minutes at that time. And then it even says that lower starting doses, slower titration, and higher targets may be considered for elderly So appendix nine is good to memorize, and this is the this is from the insulin prescription tool that's also on the website somewhere. They recently switched their website around, so now I can't find anything, and all my links don't work. Uh, because they, I, I haven't fixed them because they're still changing things, so it's pointless for me to fix it if they could still change it. Uh, but the, if, you, if you Google Diabetes Canada Insulin Prescription Tool, you'll find this thing here, and it'll show you how to uh, start basal insulin, bolus insulin, and uh, mixed insulin. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Okay, this is just some practical tips. Typically, you start 10 units and increase by one unit per night until fasting is reached. Uh, for lesser weight people, you can, for light people, you can use 50 kilograms. Uh, this is just some research done by Dr. Harris, who's a family physician out of Ontario. He found that uh, family doctors, so this is a study on family doctors in Ontario. And he found that, oh, I got a question here from <coughs> when Shelia. So Shelia asked, when would you start basal insulin in the morning? Um, typically, I, typically, I don't start basal insulin in the morning. Usually, I start it at, in the evening. There's a couple of cases, like if they're really afraid of overnight hypoglycemia or, I don't know, they exercise a lot at close to bedtime and I'm worried that they're going low. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of situations where I use basal insulin in the morning. Almost, I would say like 95, 99% of the time, I would do basal insulin at, at night. And, okay, perfect. Okay, and so this is a study on Ontario family physicians and they found that uh, family physicians really delay uh, starting insulin and intensifying insulin. They found that uh, the mean time to insulin titration is 9.3 years, and even after three years, they hadn't increased the insulin aggressively enough to get the patient to target. So lots of long delays, 
I think it's partially because you know it takes it takes a long time to titrate patients and to uh, you know really get really take time to understand the patient's concerns and to increase insulin. And I think that's where we really, really can come in. Pharmacists, nurses, dietitians. Yeah, you had a question, Julie? I was just wondering, are the patient's documents are also anymore for starting on insulin, or is it really strictly monitoring the insulin dominance? So the question is, are patients hospitalized for insulin starts? Yes. Okay. Because I know in the past that they used to be. Mm -hmm. But they're not. Are they are they now, or are they still, or depends on the GP, depends on the patient, mm -hmm. or is it like is it? Um, I'd say it's pretty common practice for the GP to start insulin nowadays. Right. And for actually for even them to like refer to a pharmacist or a dietitian or a nurse to start the insulin and track and okay. in, and increase the insulin. Yeah. So no longer hospitalization. Yeah, I don't think the hospitals are pretty full. I don't yeah. think we'd be able to. I don't think you'd be able to get a patient in for that kind of purpose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so after three years, uh, most family physicians haven't increased the insulin enough to uh, to get the patient to target. So that's where we can step in and really help the family doctor and increase that insulin while trying our best to avoid hypoglycemia. Okay, so here's a question that I always get asked by patients. You've probably been asked this question before too. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, good. So that's that's just the there is no limit. Um, I have a patient who's on a total daily dose of 350 units of insulin. He's on like, like 150 of Lantus and 75 Humalog TID or something like that. So, but he's also like 400 pounds. So, you know, usually people who are larger require more insulin. I think Dr. Sue Pearson said he, she had like a 500 unit person total day. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, like that's like almost two cartridges per day. So it's super, super insulin resistant. Yeah, so there is no limit to basal or bolus insulin. This is some research that just proves that. Uh, they did several trials where they pushed the dose, and in all of them, uh, all, in all of them, it was okay. Okay, so some, this, now this is the end of my first presentation, finally. Uh, some key takeaways are newer generation ins insulins, uh, concentrated glargine, Tugeo, IDEG, Traceba. They're more stable, they have a flatter profile, and they have comparable or less hypoglycemia than the other basal insulins. Yeah, compar and comparable with better control. Okay, so. Uh, this is just some rates of the hypoglycemia. As you can see, that uh, various various hypoglycemia during the titration period and during the steady periods, uh, there are it's, uh, less hypoglycemia in general. This was was compared to uh, Tracida, Tracida actually. Yeah, this is two JL compared to Tracida. That's the right study. Yeah, that's a, this is the right study. Yeah. Okay. Here's another common. Here's another common question that can occur. Okay. So what's the answer? C. C. Good. So Novlin has those aspar crystals, no, protamine crystals, sorry, protamine crystals, which make it cloudy, whereas the rest of these instances are all completely clear. Okay, good. Okay, so that finishes my first presentation. Okay, so let's get going here. Uh, titrating bolus insulin, insulin calculations, and GLP insulin combinations. Okay, so this was the structure, here's the structure of insulin, and again, why both basal insulins last so long? It's because they make 
So insulin by itself forms hexagons. You remember from the past pathophysiology lectures, right? And so for basal insulin, they put in things to make these structures stick, it, stick together for longer, and that's how they prolong the action. So with bolus insulin, we're doing the opposite. They're making the structure different so that these hexagons come apart really quickly. And then that's why it has fast, uh, fast, uh, fast onset of action. Because the faster the onset of action, the more it turns into more the he hexamers turn into monomers, and it's the monomers that are active for insulin. It's the monomers that get through that barrier, turn on the cells, and then turn on the cell receptors, and the cell starts taking glucose from the blood and putting it in, into the cell. Okay? Okay. So here's Bob, and this is a common scenario in my office. Bob is upset that I have. Uh, that I, I'm talking about the idea of bolus insulin. He's asking, more, more injections? Are you kidding me? Why, why is adding bolus insulin so important? Why can't I just keep increasing my basal insulin? Because, you know, that'd be way more convenient. I wouldn't have to keep two, pen, two insulin pens around. So no, that's common. That, that's common. Have you guys experienced that as well? Yeah. So why don't we try, let's, what, what do you guys think? How, how would you answer Bob right now if he was the person in your office yelling these questions? <laughs> okay, that's good, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good answer, that's a good answer. That kind of placates Bob a little bit. What, what other what other reasons are there for for starting Bob? What are uh, answers you have to Bob's so questions? The quality of life would be better. Okay, he's saying that the quality of life would be worse because now I've been injected all the time and now I need more injections. Well, That's a worse quality of life. The exercise, the that new that new place. Okay, so he has more flexibility of meals. Okay, he, he's convinced with that. Good. <laughs> Let's get one more. Let's get one more. Answer one more. Answer Bob's complaints. The usage makes the difference between you fasting glucose and the basal nutrients. Okay, good. Well, would be like when you eat more insulin. Good. Good, good. Okay, good. So uh, I don't know if you, if you heard that, but it was to, you know, handle after sugars, fasting sugars, there's different insulins for different, uh, different high glucoses, yeah. Good, okay, so, so this is one of the answers. So this is the famous slide from Monier. And with this, you can see that as your sugars get close to the target, the more the postprandial glucose contributes to the A1C. So when your sugar's high, when, it's like, when your A1C is high, like over 10.2, the most of it is from the fasting sugar. Your fasting sugar is higher all the time, and that's what's contributing to the high A1C. But as you get closer and closer to the target, it's more likely that your postprandial sugars are high. So sometimes it's difficult to get to the target unless you treat that postprandial sugar, and that's the reason, Bob, why you need to target your postprandial sugars with some bolus insulin. <coughs> yeah. So here is a picture of what your insulin, what, what your pancreas should be doing. So as, as you guys are eating right now, your pancreas is eating this big spike of insulin. This is called the first phase insulin release. And your, your body makes this huge burst of insulin. People, the researchers think it's this huge burst uh, sensitizes the muscles to really start gobbling up sugar. And so, uh, that's why it occurs. And then you get to sustain the second phase of insulin release later on. So in early diabetes, you get a little, just a little blip here for, for insulin release, not a lot. And then you have, and you have still some of that second phase insulin release. And then with late phase insulin release, your the beta cells are totally burned out. It's making a very minimal amount of insulin all the way through. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at some insulin, <coughs> insulin, uh, insulin titration questions. So these take a bit of a while, but I'll give you some time to do that. Gives me a chance to catch my breath as well. Oh, 
I had some questions if uh, the brand names and the, and the generic names will be on the exam. And for, at the beginning, when I first started writing it, it was only generic names, but now they start uh, having both. So I think both will be on the exam, assuming that they do the thing, same thing in the last couple of years. Yes, it's still reading. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Any other answers? Okay, good. So, yeah, that's right. E is the best answer. And so let's go over why each answer is not correct. Okay, so. Increasing the length. So if you take out this bedtime sugar, so you're dropping from 12.4 to 4, then 12.6 to 9.9. .9. So that is actually that Samoji, Samoji phenomenon, where they, they go low in the middle of the night and their body panics and then the sugar drops back up. So that's, that's why this one jumped up. But the next one, it went from 11.9 to 3.8, and then 13 to 4.2. So then she's dropping like 9, 10 points overnight. And so if you increase the lattice from 150 to 180, you're just going to drop them more. So th th yeah, then they just lead to more hypoglycemia. You know, you, you, like technically, yes, it might kick things over there as well, but that's not the best way to do it. Like going well here and then dragging her low so that she's okay over there. Uh, B is wrong because she's already on Genuvia and they're both DP4 inhibitors. So usually you don't, at the same, the same class together. Uh, C, what is C wrong? Well? Yeah, yeah, she's already on insulin, that's right. They're already on insulin, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't add a saponinuria. Uh, gluconorm with dinner doesn't really suck. So gluconorm with dinner isn't a bad answer, but it doesn't solve the mm -hmm. lunch, the yeah, lunch yeah. ones. Exactly. So yeah, so the best answer is adding a Peter to the meal. So this is probably Bob's profile from before. And now you, know, now you can explain to him, okay, this is why we need bolus insulin, because it's your after meals are high. And your after meals are contributing to your A1C. Yeah, question from Himish? Yes. Generally also, when patients are on insulin, the sulfur and urea are discontinued. Correct. So yeah. So the question was, if a patient's on insulin, do we discontinue the sulfur urea? And the answer is yes, usually I discontinue them. Um, usually not at first. Like if they're coming in and their A1C is high and I'm starting them on insulin, say their A1C is like nine or something like that, and I'm starting them on insulin. The, that sulfonylurea is probably, without the sulfonylurea, they might, their A1C might even be higher. And I'm starting them usually on low dose of insulin. So usually I'll keep it on until their uh, sugars are on target. And then I'll discontinue the sulfonylurea. Then usually I have to bump up the insulin further, usually about five ten units to cover what was covered by the sulfonylurea, and then uh, and then and then do it that way. There's no right or wrong answer for that, but that's just what I do. I continue it until they're at target, and then get rid of it once they're on target. It's similar for medicine. Sorry, the glucose. Uh, so for gluconorm, if they're on bolus, if they're on basal, if they're just on pure basal insulin, sometimes the gluconorm can help with those after meal sugars. Okay. Not sometimes their their beta cell dysfunction is so bad that whether they take it or not, it makes no difference. Um, that's more of a case by case. Uh, that's where your cl clinical judgment would come in. Um, yeah, I don't. For, so far, areas like that, micron, glyburide, glucoside, those uh, I would discontinue once it's still a target. The gluconorm, that's a case by case. Gluconorm is also depends. Does it say what's the cardiovascular uh, stuff? So, you know, if the gluconorm is not good, it could have some. Yeah, that's true. It's worse with uh, glyburide, it's worse for that. But yeah, the um, gluconome has been a bad thing. And as is it true? Um, yeah. When you're looking at a you want to look for lows first. Yes. Hypoglycemia first and mm -hmm. find out why it's happening. Like you said, the emoji effect on that one day. Mm -hmm. But you're right, if you keep bumping on the base, they're just going to get lower and lower. Exactly. Time. 
and then you have to look for the highs behind the horizon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so generally, like, I know instant titration is sometimes seen scary, but there's just really two steps. One, look for lows. If the lows are uh, in the morning fasting, then you decrease their basal. If the lows are after meals, then you look at, uh, then you decrease their bolus or their gluconorm or see, it, like, are they exercising after work and then they're going low before dinner. Then you look for highs. Uh, if it's high fasting, you increase their basal. If they're high after meals, then you increase their bolus. Oh, and I got a question. Oh, sorry, I got some questions here from the audience. Uh, can you start them with one meal? Oh, good. Uh, okay. So I've just got a question here from Shelia asking, can you just start them at one meal for the bolus insulin? And that's correct, yes. I'm going to go over a slide about that later about how you can do one, one injection per, you can start with one uh, bolus injection. And usually pa patients are more, um, they're more accepting of that if you just start them at one. In this case, that's just how the question is written. And it, it'd be okay to do either or, like start them on one or start them on, start them on one and then eventually expand to more or just to start them on all three. And then Sheila's second question was, would you reduce or discontinue actors? And the answer would be yes. Um, and I'll get, uh, I'll talk about that more later. I'm sorry, in this case, yeah. like that, with which one of the bone you will start? So if the question because was... usually it's the one, we start with the one, okay, like the one pulse. Correct, one. yeah. Um, here, here, I'll go, go, I'm going to go into a study on that uh, in, in just a couple of slides, okay? But those are excellent <laughs> questions. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. If you can apply to this case, to specifically, this case? Yeah, afterwards, whenever, whenever I have time. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is like So, if we're me, I would probably start. I probably, first thing, I'd try to get more, mm -hmm. more, more Gina, questions. Right? Or, like, the biggest jump is at, actually here, actually. This is 8.4. Yeah. This is 8.4. Yeah. 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 This is a 3 point jump. This is a 4 point jump. That's a four point jump. So, um, yeah, I, I, depending on the numbers, I, I would probably, if I was just only given this, I might, I would be tempted to start it at breakfast because that's the biggest jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. No problem. Okay, next insulin titration question. Okay, let me read this myself. Okay, yes. Yeah. No, not, not this one. This one only has one. This one only has one. And C, C yeah, so, so C is yeah. first, correct. So in general, you always treat hypoglycemia before you treat hyperglycemia. So treat lows before highs. So let's go over this. So uh, let's go over why. So A, you're, it's true, sure, once he's not a target, um, but generally you treat lows before highs. And Increasing her TGO may would bring her down at all places, so it might make her lows here worse. Uh, B. Uh, yeah, well, she only had one high. Generally, it's not bad. Like Seven point five to nine point four. That's two difference, which is okay. Uh, Six point six to eight point eight is two point two difference, which is still okay. So that that answer isn't correct. Um, so C is the best answer because it focuses right here. So she treats in her to jail, she takes it at bedtime. But if you look, she went from a 6 to 7.5 and a 6.1 to a 6.6. .6. So that means she's going up at night. So you decrease her to jail, this will go, this will go up. And eventually it will filter through and this will go up too. But that's a very inefficient way of doing it. So C is the best answer by far. But the second option would be increasing morning and Yes, you would handle this eventually. 
But on the, on the exam, there'll be lots of questions where there's multiple good answers, but you have to choose the best answer. Yeah. I think the best thing would be when you yeah. hyperlysemia. Yeah, generally you always treat hyperlysemia before you treat anything else. So yeah, question. Sorry, you just, I noticed how you calculate. Yeah. So you go, what's the difference? You don't go as we go for the target, right? So as by recommendation oh, after, okay. you know? Um, like that's what I noticed now. You, you can you can actually go with the targets, but like how much it increases by gives you a clue of how well the insulin's working. What's so, uh, how big the gap? Uh, if you don't you don't want your postprandial sugars going more than three above what they were fasting. Okay, so this one's more than three. Yeah, right? yeah, and but you can still, uh, yeah, from preprandial to postprandial. Yeah. Yeah, 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 You can, but you can still use the five to ten thing if it's That's left. Where I'm yeah. Just now, yeah, you you can you can do it either way, but it's just in and in real life in real life you can eat away and then just you're just trying to figure out how which where to adjust the insulin. So what does it say from three to five? Uh, uh, of more three, I think it's in the essentials or the guidelines. Is it essentials? I think it's in the essentials actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the Saskatchewan module. Yes, you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And that, there's a Saskatchewan insulin module. Is that available somewhere? It's on my website somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, any questions? Okay. It's all good? Okay, perfect. Okay, and I have one more question here. This is probably the hardest of the three questions. So. Which you Z? That is the correct answer. Okay, so let's go through why each one's wrong. So there's a couple things. So he's eating a high glycemic index diet. And so all our, a lot of our patients go and find crazy diets to follow. So what would a high glycemic index diet look like? White bread, palm, stuff like that. Maybe he read it on the internet somewhere. From like Dr. Oz recommends a high glycemic index diet or some, some BS like that. Um, so, so his sugar spikes are really high after after meals. Okay. The second thing is that he's taking humulin R right before each meal, but that's that's incorrect. Humulin R is one of those slower insulins. Remember, they're supposed to be taken half an hour before before meals. They're super inconvenient that way. That's why people don't use them anymore. So, yeah. So if you kind of remember the peak, like so, his sugar spikes are like this because he's on a high glycemic index diet. Now he's taking an insulin that's supposed to be taken half an hour before, but he's taking right after the end. So the insulin is spiking way over here, but his sugar spikes right over here. So that's why his after meals are so high, and then the R is kicking in later and making him too low. So you should you should have you should be memorizing this. This is appendix six. And good. That's good. Someone to memorize it. All all of you should start memorizing it. As you can see, the half you can see the half light there, um, onset like human R, it's half an hour onset. So that's why that's why D is right. So uh, why to share decreasing it? That that wouldn't fix anything. Like it would just make D's higher, um, and D's would be less low, but this D's would be higher. So that's that's the wrong. That's not the best answer.
Um, increasing conditioning with R wouldn't help because you would still have those big spikes and then go even lower afterwards. Uh, switching to a medium GI diet. So usually guidelines recommend a low GI diet. So, so that's not the best answer because you want to go on a low GI diet, not a medium GI diet. It's a trick question, yes. So D is correct, and then R is the same thing. Increasing it will just lead to high sugars after and then crashing below. Yeah. So my question is, uh, if I take like, like, yes. like if a particular insulin is uh, more rapid, it onsets in 9 to 20 minutes, the onset of action. So the patient should take 15 minutes before the meal or with meal. Okay. So, so the question. So here, the question is, uh, if the onset is, you know, fifteen minutes, should you be taking fifteen minutes before the meal? That's th that's a question, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, you can do it that way, but you don't need to do it that way. So for R and Toronto, those specifically, you have to take half an hour before meal. That's just the way the monograph states it. For newer insulins like, uh, you know, Epidra, Humalog, Nuvirapid, Biast. All of them say you can take right before the meal. You can take it 15 minutes if you wanted to, but generally they're taking right at the meal. Oh, yeah. So with meal, or even after completing the meal, also they can take it. Yeah, like the, uh, if you look at the monographs, they can about five minutes after or something like that. It, it would probably be best if you took it before the meal, um, especially if it's like a long meal. But uh, yeah, you could, if the person forgets, they can still take it up to like five minutes after the meal. But it's not okay. as probably not as good as taking it right before the meal. A pedra is twenty up to twenty minutes after the start. Of oh, okay. A pedra is up to twenty minutes it's after the start of the meal. Yeah. Seriously, it is to save little kids and little people who are overworking. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.
And so, uh, yeah, with metformin, I can reduce the dose. Uh, Sulfonylureas so are usually discontinued. So glyburide, glucoside, stuff like that. Once I start bolus insulin, then for sure I'll, I get rid of the glucagon and stuff like that, because then it's, it's a duplication of effect. So TZD, so you would think, so TZD is like Actos and Avandia. You would think that their insulin sensitizers, they would work really well with insulin. The problem is, is that for some reason, they cause a lot of weight gain and especially a lot of uh, edema. And so that's why the combination isn't, uh, the, the combination isn't contraindicated, but it's not indicated, meaning like it's not technically approved. So, tech, so usually I get people off their actos once I start them on insulin. Um, let's see here. Incretins like DPP4s and GLPs, usually I keep those. They have good dose reduction, just kind of like metformin. And same thing with SGLT2s. Uh, usually I can get away from reduced dose. So I usually I keep those on. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to talk about this really quickly. So this was a stepwise trial. And what they did was a trial of, they wanted to figure out, okay, when is the best time to start bolus insulin? Is it best to start at all three? Is it best to start at the biggest meal of the day? Or is it best to start where the post preprandial and postprandial spike is the highest? And so what they found was that it, it didn't really matter. Uh, you can, there was no A1C reduction, no uh, hyperglycemia was similar. So basically you can start it with either the biggest meal of the day or the meal where there's the biggest, uh, biggest postprandial rise. Yeah. They also did, I can't remember if it was this study or not, but they also did a study where they started people on uh, one unit, one meal per day, two meals per day, or three meals a day of rapid acting insulin. They found that they got the biggest bang out of the first meal per day, a little bit less from the second and the least from the third. That's the smart study. That's the smart study. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, good. That's the smart thing. I knew it was something yeah. like that. Yeah. So generally, yeah, I usually, unless their like sugars are super, super high after meals, usually I start it only at one or two meals per day. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into calculations because that's going to show up on the exam for sure. So insulin to carb ratios, figure this one out. This is assuming a sandwich has two slices of bread. I think I'm not bad. Thank you. Oh, and you don't get a calculator for the test. So, get, so practice when you practice doing this in your head. Here we are. Here we, are. we have some tentative faces. Okay, let's just all learn together. Just shout out what you think it is. Okay, so here, let's go through this one by one. Okay, so the correct answer is A. And so here's how you calculate it. So, okay, he's having, he's having a sandwich, so it's two slices of bread. Uh, you take the total carb, but remember, the total carb includes the fiber, and fiber doesn't break down into sugar. Fiber just breaks down into fiber and you pass it out. So that doesn't turn into sugar. So you take 15 minus three, which is 12, times two, and then divide by five, which is five, but you write it, you always round down. Yeah, to be safe. Yeah, you always run down to be safe. You'd rather even be a little bit high than a little bit low. Yeah. So. Okay. Does that does this make sense for everybody? So six is if you forgot the fiber and you round it up. Because if you took the 15 times 2 divided by 5, you get 6. 
<coughs> you didn't subtract the fiber for that one. And then C is if you somehow caught, if you got three slices and D is four slices of bread. Yeah. So, question. Are there going to say how many slices there? Because if you tell two slices, are there going to say how many slices there? So, uh, the question was, are, can we assume that a sandwich has two slices of bread? Or, uh, they got to, um, I think it's reasonable to assume that a sandwich has two slices of bread. Um, yeah. <laughs> So this kind of question can come, right? It's oh yeah, this is, a, this is a typical, typical exam question. Yes, that's right. So you have to, yeah, you have to you assume that they know you're just two slices. But even though it's the same one bread, it doesn't make sense because then it's going to be 12 grams divided by 5. Yeah, so that'd be only so two. No, yeah. 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 There's no, no real answer for that. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, sometimes, okay, so that's one way to, so how do we get to that ratio? How do we get to that five to one? So how, we can take a couple methods uh, to calculate the insulin to carb ratio. The first one is you add up their bolus and basal insulin for their total daily dose, and you take 500 divided by total daily dose. And so this formula was made a long time ago, and how, how it came to be was that People, the researchers assumed people would eat roughly 500 grams of carbohydrate per day. And you take that, take that number, divide by total daily dose, and that's how much insulin they would need per carb. So people who needed a lot of, who were on a lot of insulin, they assumed you need you're more insulin resistant, so you need more insulin per carb. Because if say, you're, if, say you are very insulin sensitive, you're on 10 units per day, so you take, 500 divided by 10, it'd be a carb ratio of 1 to 50. But say you're like my 400 pound patient who's on 400 units. You take 500 divided by 400, and then you need a lot more insulin per carb. Typically though, I, like I don't find this formula very um, accurate because typically people don't eat 500 carbs per day. That's like a lot of carbs. Yeah, that's like a lot. Maybe an athlete, yeah. So you see, even the dietitians are weighing in here. Like, uh, you know, 500 carbs is, is, is a lot. And so I don't find this equation very accurate, but this has shown up on the test where you, you have to, they're asking you for insulin carb ratio. They, they only give you how much insulin they're taking. So you add up all the insulin they're taking and then take 500 divided by their total daily dose. So that's one way of doing it. Um, a second way is this weight method. And so this is based on Usually, the heavier the person, the more insulin they need. And so, the higher your weight, the higher your insulin to carb ratio. Uh, this is another way of doing it, but I've never, I've never used this in real life. And um, I can't, I've actually, actually never seen this on a test either, because I think it's fairly inaccurate. But this is a second way of doing it. And if say you came to this question and you had like no idea, then you can just kind of estimate, okay, the heavier the person is, usually the more insulin they'll need. And then this is the last method. Oh, this is, oh. Um, this is before breakfast. I switch. Okay. And so uh, this is the, this is the this is the method that usually works the best for me because I actually use like the real life sugars. So let me give you some time. This is probably the most time consuming one. Remember, you won't have a calculator on the test, so you might need to use some pen and paper for this. How long have I been talking for? Oh my god, an hour already. <laughs> what does it mean like it says two units? That mean times two? Uh, so that means he took two units for this meal. That's mean it times two, right? Uh, for example, 45 minus 5 times two? Wait, what are you talking about? Oh, we're not taking, you know, no, we keep 45 because it's not the label. Uh, yeah, this is the total carbs, okay, and this is the total fiber, yeah, and then they took two units. Oh, two units. Oh, so that's that's oh, two units of insulin. Of insulin, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Two, one, two, one, two, one. I was trying to squeeze everything into a small. So you're trying to figure out which of these ratios is best works best for this guy. 
Yeah, so this is the total tonal carbs in the meal and the total fiber, total carbs and total fiber in the meal. That's correct, yeah. <laughs> so you probably need a pen and paper for this one. <laughs> Um, well, we'll let, let everyone have let everyone have a chance. That's very really impressive. <laughs> I have a question from the audience. Okay, we'll we will get to that soon. <laughs> Okay, here. So let's let's go through let's go through this together. <laughs> okay. So the answer is. Why is this that thing? Oh, wait. That's right. Okay. So the answer is B. And so let's calculate this. Okay. So let's take this one. So we take forty-five total carbs minus five. So that's forty grams of carbs in total. He's taking two units, so that's a one to 20 ratio, right? Because he's 40 cards and took two units. But the sugars went from 6.8 to 12.3, but that's not enough. It's, it wasn't, uh, it, the ratio didn't work for him, okay? Let's take this guy, uh, 5.2, and he went to 3.8. So he took 16, he total cards, minus one is 15. Then you divide, he took, took three, so that's a one to five ratio, right? But he went low. His sugar actually decreased uh, too much. So one to five is incorrect. Okay, let's take a look at uh, that step one. So 62 minus two divided by four. So 62 minus two is 16, and then divided by four is 15. But his sugars went up quite a bit, over three, like above target. And so that means this one to 15 is wrong as well. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, 28 minus 3 is 25, divided by 5 is 1 to 5, and again, 1 to 1. So that, so that one's, that, so 1 to 5 is again wrong. Uh, 94 minus 4, 90 divided by 9 is 1 to 10. He went on target before and on target afterwards, so E is the correct answer. Alright? Oh, that's how we thought so you can do that in real life because people take, you know, get people to bring you what they ate, how much insulin they took, and then you can eventually figure this out. I'm sorry, but then yeah. why do we have to uh, take away the fiber? Because I am going to take the fibers, give mm -hmm. the label, the food label. So, but this one. So, this is kind of like with this is kind of a food label, like right? oh. yeah, included in. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's why you took, it's total carbs, so you took away the fiber, yeah. Okay. okay so then you need to calculate each meal, right? Correct, yeah. So it's the first, this is, it's time consuming on the test and time consuming in real life. So, so, but this, like, but then you can figure out, okay, hey, guy, like, Rob, your insulin to carb ratio is one in 10, and now he can, now he can actually, you know, okay, I, if I eat this much carbs, I take this much insulin. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So let's keep going. So this will be there, right? Like on you. Yeah, this will be on my videos, yeah. Um, insulin sensitivity factor or correction factor is the other calculation that you might have to do on the exam. Oh, I've got a question. Okay, so I've got a question. Uh, so, hold on. Okay, I'll do Kim's first. In the last example, BG didn't go up by three, barely rose. Is that okay? Yeah, like if you can get the sugars to just slightly, we expect sugars to rise after a meal, but if you can get it so perfectly that it didn't even jump up, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. And then Sheely asks, will this method be on exam? Uh, yes, I believe there was a question like this on the exam one. So you have to fit from what they're, what they're, uh, they give you some foods and you have to figure out their, the, the best insulin to carb ratio. Okay, perfect. So insulin sensitive sensitivity factor or correction correction ratio or correction factor is the other kind of common one that will, will show up on the exam or might show up on the exam. What slide am I on? Okay, 10 more slides. So I have been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, let's go through this. So the answer is, Okay, answers five minutes. And so let's go through this. Let's go through this. Uh, okay, so if you look at four, so each each unit brings you down 1.5, right? So four times 1.5 will bring you down six. So 12.7 minus six is 6.7. But for the target rate, is one to six. So that's above. Uh, five will bring you down to. Actually, I need, I need a calculator too. Yeah. <laughs> I can't I need a calculator. Okay, it will bring it down to, let me get this in my head. 5.2, 5.2. Okay, so that's. <laughs> so 5.2, so that brings it to 6 will bring it down 9 to 3.7, which is too low. And then 7 will bring it down like just way, way too low. When you got this formula, sorry, I, I haven't yet studied this. Sure. So this, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> the formula? So it's just, you take the insulin and you times it by that, and that's how much it brings it down by. Oh, so, the insulin thing, right? So then, uh, yeah. So if I take four units. Okay, four five. units times 1.5. Okay, so it's uh, 1.5. Well, it's 6. 6. So 12.7 minus 6 is 6.7. How did you get 12.7? That's, that's your sugar right now. Oh, okay. So that's her sugar right now. So that's what you're trying to get her to target. So then now her sugar is 12.7 minus 7.7. Uh, no, 12.7 is 6.7. <laughs> yeah, this one's, let me finish with her first. So 6.7, which is above, but she has a target of 4 to 6. So that's incorrect. Yeah. And then if you do the 5, that brings you to 5.2, which is correct. 5 times? 1.5. 7.5. Yeah. And then 12, 7, 9, 7, Yeah, so you can, and then you can do yeah. that calculation for all of that. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so you had a question? Yeah, so can we just not take middle, middle, which is 5? Yes. Between 4 and 6? 
Say what? It's the range of that target is five, it's not four to six. Okay, but if you did six, like say you no, took no, six, yes, yeah. yeah, like calculate it out. If you did six, you get minus nine, right? Twelve, then it would be twelve points. Not the units, but the uh, target. The target. Instead of four to six, five. just keep five, which is the middle, the middle number. For the blood sugar target? Right. Nine, yeah, five. you could you could say that, yeah. Like if you got the sugar to anywhere between four and six, then the answer is right. But if you got above or below, then the answer is wrong. Yeah. And so because if you took if you took six, six times one point five is nine. And then twelve point seven minus nine is three point seven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exactly in the Yeah, exactly. But if you took six units, it would be six times one point five, which is nine. Then twelve point seven minus nine is three point seven, and that's below the target of four. Yeah. Okay. So where does this calculation come from? Uh, so, okay. So you can calculate the insulin sensitive factor correction ratio by adding up the bolus and basal. If they're assuming that there are no rapid or rapid acting insulin, you take 100 divided by the total daily dose. So where does this number 100 come from? This was done by a prominent endocrinologist in Atlanta like several decades ago, and he came up with this number of 100. And so that's, and then we've always been using 100 and based on his research. And um, the number is different if, I believe it's 83 if you are using human R or uh, Toronto, but because people rarely use that anymore, typically it's 100 divided by total daily dose. And that 100 is, where, is what that researcher came up with. I, I don't know how he came up with 100, but that's, that's the number that we always use now. Okay. I'm gonna to try to wrap this up quickly because I'm getting tired. Um, okay, so, so we, talked about, uh, we talked about Bob at the beginning, how he was mad that you have to come back. He, now he has to take a bunch of injections and he has to take two injections and he has to take multiple injections per day. So a bit of a way around that is combining the basal insulin with the GLP. And so there's a bunch of benefits to that. Uh, with basal insulin, they're simply titrate, you know, they're, you just take them once a day typically, they don't have a lot of weight increase, and yeah. And then GLPs are great, great because their GLPs are also simple to initiate, they reduce the most handle sugars, and they're, they mitigate some of the weight gain from the basal insulin. And so by combining it, you can get, you know, a, a, better, a better product in one injection once a day. Instead of Bob at the beginning, who's mad at me for multiple injections and multiple pens and multiple, multiple, multiple everything. So yeah, so these actually work quite good together. Um, yeah. And this is from the guidelines. Uh, you know, you can consider addition of GLP receptor agonist, DB4, STLT2 before adding bolus insulin because they found that these therapies are a little bit simpler and have less lows and a little bit less intrusive. Like basal insulin is typically easy to use because you take it right before bed. But like even for now, if you, have, if you are on bolus insulin, you have to you know, excuse yourself, go to the washroom, try to calculate how much pizza you go eat, to get your injection, come back kind of thing. So it's a lot, lot less convenient. Um, this talks about long, short acting and long acting GLPs, and you can find that uh, things like uh, shorter acting ones have a better, better shorter acting GLPs have a better reduction in postprandial sugars. Uh, long acting GLPs they are convenient; they have a stronger reduction in fasting sugars and less of a reduction in postprandial sugars. Uh, this is American. This is the American guideline, so don't don't memorize this. But for them, they're saying that okay, you can add a GLP uh, GLP receptor agonist for glycemic control even before con considering it even before prandial sometimes. So this is just American guidelines. Don't memorize that. So there's two uh, 
combos of basal insulin and GLPs. The first one's Soliqua. Um, you, this is just typical starting dosage. You start. Uh, What's the typical starting dosage? It depends on their insulin. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's yeah, so right. these are, yeah, that's what was used in the study in that international protocol. So that's yeah. probably not what you're doing in practice. Mm -hmm. It's based on what the patient's basal insulin dose is. Yeah. And so, you always back titrate because you're bringing on the GLP. Yeah, so typically I think it's like if you're on 60 to 30, yeah. or 30 yeah. plus. Yeah. yeah. So if you're on like 30, you would start them on 15. If, if, so the patient comes in around yeah. 30 minutes of landing. Yeah. The fasting is good. Mm -hmm. The postprandials are high. Yeah. Which contributes to the A1C being mm -hmm. high when your postprandials are high. Right? Yeah. You would start that patient on 30 minutes of sleep. 30 you minutes of sleep. Two products. Yeah. Twice as much A1C reduction. Mm -hmm. The patient's on 28 units of landing. Start them on 15. Yeah. Of okay. Because you're going to start with GLP, you get a little bit of GLP, it's a one to three ratio mm -hmm. with every unit of insulin. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope you guys heard that at home. So, typically it's like 15 to 30 units is the starting dose, yeah. depending on how much large you were on. Right. Or other insulin. Or other insulin. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then the other one is Zoltofi. Uh, yeah, typical. Typical is 16 and 15. I believe they have a very similar. It's very similar yeah. based on their previous insulin dose. Mm -hmm. And you titrate from there on. Yeah. Because you're using the GLP-1. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I thought this one had the starting dose. I thought these slides had the starting dose. So sorry about that. Um, but yeah, those are those are the two combo products available on the market currently. Okay. Uh, so this just talks, this is compared the combo product to uh, bolus insulin. And they found that uh, the combination, combination products have better, a bit of bit better A1C reduction, less hypoglycemia, and then it was in terms of equivalent uh, healthcare costs, it was roughly equivalent. Yeah. Okay. Here's a one, one last sample question for the day. Okay, so let's go through this. So the answer is A, because remember, it's not inappropriate. So what's it really asking for? What's appropriate? What, which, which, which is appropriate? So in people with uh, history of medullary thyroid cancer, that's a direct contraindication to all GLP analogs. If you have any history or anything like that, that's a contraindication. Uh, people, if a person has a severe phobia of needles, then that's kind of, it's not an official contraindication, but it's pretty hard to get someone on a, on a injection kind of medication. GLP analogs are not indicated with type 1 diabetes. There's a couple of endocrinologists in the city that actually do use GLPs with uh, type 1s, but for the purposes of the exam, uh, it's, it's an absolute contraindication, no. And like, and in terms of like, well, pharmacists and prescribing and like uh, malpractice insurance, that's, that's a bit of a tricky one too. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so not the inappropriate, so which is appropriate. So for this one, it's, uh, you, can use, you can use lexazenitide in a renal function of 30, so A is the correct answer. Okay. So this just talks about some of the complementary benefits of adding a basal insulin into and a GLP-1. They kind of, it's convenient. Uh, it's good in reducing sugars. You do a, a slow titration to reduce their nausea, lower risk of hypoglycemia than a bolus insulin and 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 or primal insulin, and uh, it's weight neutral. Typically, adding bolus insulin leads to weight gain, whereas you do something like this, it's weight neutral. Okay, and we are at the end. Any questions? Yes. So you said with basal insulin, yes. metformin can be. 
continue. Yes. So even for the type one, do we give metformin? No. Okay. So the question was for type twos, we have metform, we have metformin, and we continue the metformin with starting insulin. And the question is, do we do that with type one? So t for type ones, metformin is contraindicated anyway. So you wouldn't have a patient, you wouldn't start a patient on a type one patient on metformin. Now again, some endocrinologists do do that because they do initiate metformin because there is that insulin, uh, the insulin resistance benefit. Yeah. But for the exam, it's definitely no. And for you know, for malpractice insurance, it's kind of a no as well. <laughs> Mostly a no as well. Yeah, like you know, if you're prescribing and you do off-label stuff like this, and you get, you, there's a lawsuit. You don't like a specialist can do this because they're specialists. If you're like maybe continuing the prescription and the specialist said it was okay, then maybe, but um, it would be more difficult to prove in court. Yeah, and I, I intend to go through my career without using my malpractice insurance. <laughs> so that's that's one of my goals in, in my career. Yeah, question. Sorry. Um, this is Siliqua and this the combination. Yeah, Siliqua and Zotolfi. Yeah. New ones, right? uh, yeah, they are new. They just came out this last year or this year? Last year, not October, and um, Zoltofi off January. Yeah, so, so very, new. very new, like October and January. So, um, do you think it's going to be questions on this one? Because I this idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> for, for stuff showing up in an exam, the deadline is February 1st. Anything past February 1st will not be on the exam. Anything before February 1st is fair game for the exam. Mm -hmm. so, then the so this technically could year, show up on the exam. Be, <laughs> on the exam. October was October 2018. Mm -hmm. And I would say January 2018 was yeah. so it's just basal insulin with the GLP-1 because yeah. they actually work very well. Yeah, together. so there's not a lot to Yeah, there's not a lot to memorize. It's just both of them combined. That's yeah. all. Yeah. So it's not like a new class you have to like no understand. Class. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the people at home? Okay, perfect. Oh, another question, yeah. So if a person is on uh, long acting basal insulin, yeah. they're starting on GLP. Yeah. Any. So is there any dose change in the length or so it's the same as before changing? So if there is a patient on on pre existing bolus, bolus basal, basal, yeah. basal insulin and, and you're adding Victoza or uh, Vixenatide or okay. So typically yes. Uh, well it depends, I guess. Um, I don't think they'll be that specific on exam, but in real life, if their sugar was quite good, if they're like, you know, if their sugars are 47, 48, and I was adding uh, GLP onto basal insulin, I would reduce the basal insulin. Typically about 30 to 50% even, depending on how close to target they were. If you're having lows, then maybe like 50%. But if your sugars are like 20 all the time, and I'm adding adelixine onto lattice, then I would for sure keep them, I wouldn't reduce the insulin because their sugars are too high anyway. So I want them to come down a bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, oh, questions from the audience. One sec. Perfect. Okay. No, uh, that's, thank you. Thank you, Google. And thank you, Celia, for listening. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending my presentation. Um, there is the uh, feedback forms. If you could fill them up, that would be great. Uh, remember to send me questions for Dr. Sue Peterson's event, and I think that's the next time I'll see you guys. All right, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.